Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, great to see you. Um, and uh, just to uh, highlight the evening, we'll have Charlie coming up in a minute to talk about uh, Tunnel Talk. And then uh, we're gonna hand it off to George and he's gonna give us some insight into uh, the work of the decoders and any questions we might have and his insights around um, how the decoders really fit our era and some uh, insights, maybe tips around programming. Um, but before we start, we have a member here that we haven't had in a long time, although we can't see him. I wanted to give Wallace uh, a minute or two just to introduce himself. So Wallace, uh, the question that I would ask you would be, one, uh, how did you find us? And two, what is your interest around the Civil War railroads? And you're on mute right now. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, Wallace Steinbrecher here, uh, normally from uh, Talking Rock, Georgia, which is in the northern part of the state, uh, fairly close to Chattanooga. Um, but uh, being held uh, against my will right now at uh, Fort Bliss out in El Paso, Texas, um, serving out my, my 39th year in the Army here, uh, providing uh, military support to the uh, southwest border for uh, Department of Homeland Security, and uh, also providing uh, COVID support uh, to some of the medical facilities here along the border, uh, using Army assets and doctors to, uh, to help out the local hospitals. Uh, if, uh, if I don't get promoted this year, I'll be retiring in August with uh, 39 and a half years of service and uh, hopefully wow. heading back to Georgia for the, for the last time. But uh, to, to answer your question, uh, Tom, uh, what, uh, I've been a modeler since, uh, since about uh, probably, probably six years old. Uh, I won't tell you how long, that, how long ago that's been, <laughs> but uh, considerable amount of time. Uh, primary interest is in the uh, modeling the Virginian Railway in uh, HO scale in 1924. Uh, but a secondary interest and a second layout is uh, the, uh, the uh, war between the states in uh, 1862, 1863, so the uh, early and mid years of the war. Uh, what got me what got me started in that direction, uh, Bernie, this is where I throw you under the bus, was your uh, your diorama at the Lyceum in Alexandria uh, that I saw when I was on one of my rotations through the DC area there wow. and uh, thought that that was that was an outstanding use of uh, of uh, the the mantua uh, mantua cars and just the I, I just really liked the entire concept so uh, later on got uh, got hooked up with Tom and uh, Help to uh, help to host the uh, the get together in Savannah. Brilliant. What Tom? Two years ago, probably. Yeah, yeah. It seems like two years ago. Lou Caputo and I uh, helped put that thing together. So uh, that's that's my story at this point. Yeah, it was a great meet. Thank you, thank you. So uh, with that, I won't hold Charlie back any longer. Uh, Charlie, so the floor is yours, my friend. I may struggle to get control of the woofers and tweeters here but so I, I hit share screen and then uh you should be good to go uh, let me, let's let's see what happens <laughs> all right getting close charlie for george's uh sake he, he models the uh, memphis and charleston <clears throat> <laughs> I spent my word. Oh, what, what does that look like? That's full screen. That it? Full tilt boogie? Good. All right. Uh, so, um, this, it, it may, you may call it tunnel vision after you hear this thing, but uh, <laughs> it's just, a, <laughs> it's a fascinating um, thing that we learned at one of our conventions. I wanted to, to share with you the lost tunnel of Raccoon Mountain. All right. So I think that Bernie put me onto this book, The Rough Side of War. And it is a fabulous um, diary. It's, it's slightly incomplete because some, one of the guys that fought with, with uh, Chesley Moman uh, wanted to borrow one of his diaries to work on his own book and never returned it to the family. So 
in places it's incomplete, but basically Chesley Moseman enlists as a private in Illinois and fights almost every major battle in the West. Uh, a good friend enlisted with him and, and that friend died in basically the last battle uh, at Nashville. But uh, he was, he was uh, orphaned. He was raised by his aunts. After the war, he studied with an attorney and eventually he uh, was on the Supreme Court of Illinois. So, and it, it's a very generous book. You know, he, he never wakes up and says, I'm gonna kill 10 Johnny Rebs today. It's, you know, he, he wakes up and said it was kind of cold last night. I had to knock two inches of snow off me, but it looks like a pretty day today. I mean, it really is an amazingly positive book. But in, in that book, uh, there's a passage where he says, uh, he was assigned to protect the engineers reconstructing the trestle at Whiteside, which, you know, I talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, and then he said, I'm on leave today, and I decided to walk over and inspect the tunnel through the mountain. And so Whiteside trestle is probably almost 20 miles from the tunnel through um, Missionary Ridge. And so I realized there must be some other tunnel around, but I, I, I never, uh, never could find it in my reading. All right, let me... All right. Yeah, this is here for a couple of reasons. I think that, I mean, we've had some great conventions. We really have. And the one we had in 2014 in Chattanooga was just fabulous. Um, you know, Jim Ogden from the National Park Service and Mark Brainerd, who's a historian with the Tennessee Valley Railroad, I mean, they just put on a show for us and we, we saw, you know, quite a bit. And so we, you know, we got there Thursday, we met Friday and Saturday, we walked for seven hours. You know, we saw the last ditch with these guys. And, and so at the end of the day, uh, Brainerd goes, who wants to see the lost tunnel? And it was just crickets and uh, jungle noises at that point. But I said, I do, I do. And so anyway, uh, so to refresh everyone's memory, uh, let me see, you can see my arrow? Yeah. Where? Right up in the upper right corner. Oh yeah, yep, okay. the orange, so, yep. So we stayed at the beautiful Clarion Inn Motel uh, in Chattanooga. And where the Lost Tunnel is, is kind of bottom left of your screen. And I got it marked as the old National Chattanooga Tunnel, the Eastern Portal. Wow. So it's, it's a few miles from the, uh, the hotel. And basically you drive down I-24 and here at kind of the lower in the middle, you get off on a road that uh, it was actually called Old Hooker's Road. That, that wasn't from the professional experience here. But you know, obviously, Hooker had a lot to do with the history in Chattanooga, and especially the battle. All right. So anyway, you go down Old Hooker's Road, uh, and you, you come, you know, come to where the the railroad uh, ran. And so let me show you that again. Oops. Hmm. All right, I'm in trouble. All right, so this is actually a Google satellite image. And to the left are the northbound lanes of I-24. Uh, in the middle is this little two lane blacktop uh, of Old Hooker's Road. And you can see this little kind of clearing down here, which is kind of like a dump. Uh, you know, people would throw trash down in there. And then there's about a 10 or 15 foot high berm uh, separating where we would, could park our car until we could see the, the dual tracks, you know, basically where the National Chattanooga line used to run. You actually, up here we see the thumbtack. This is actually the, the portal wall. You know, the satellite doesn't do a good image of the three dimensions, but you'll see a picture of that in a second. So I worried a little bit about leaving my van out here in the middle of nowhere, uh, this parking area. But Brainerd said he thought everything would be okay. 
And sure enough, uh, just as we were pulling in, somebody came out to give us a hand. Uh, you got to realize this, it, it's interesting, the, the Civil War maps show uh, that the tunnel was actually in Georgia, okay? Today's maps uh, show it's in Tennessee, and you know, that's been a bone of contention uh, between Tennessee and Georgia, is that last little strip of land there. But sure enough, he, he watched our car for us. So Brainerd and I hiked up to the top of this berm just in time to catch, I swear it must have been a two mile long freight train. <laughs> and so uh, this thing's going by, going by, going by, and there's Brainerd just, you know, smiling like the, the cat that swallowed the canary. I mean, he knew I was in for a treat. Um, and so when the trains cleared, this is what you could see. So you're seeing the, the dual modern tracks, but just to the north of it, you're looking right down the barrel of this just beautiful, you know, uh, cut stone tunnel. Mm. We'll see some more of that. And, and Brainerd thinks this is one of only two structures in the Chattanooga area that go back to the original, uh, to the Civil War era. This and the, you know, the tunnel through Missionary Ridge that we saw as a group. All right, so here it is up a little closer. You, you can almost read the inscription stone above it, and, and we figured that out eventually. Uh, and in the National Chattanooga Railroad Records, they describe the exact dimensions of the retaining walls, these kind of arched retaining walls, mm. and the length of the tunnel. So. The, the tunnel is 300 feet long, and it's, it's all cut stone. Beautiful. I mean, it's just splendid. All right. So, you know, it was just, it's up there doing its thing. It's probably used until uh, between the First and Second World Wars. And uh, so they obviously got into the wing walls of the tunnel with the, the modern uh, tracks. And so this is that you're looking 300 feet. You're looking all the way down the tunnel. Mm. Well, this thing. And you can see, you can see a broken table uh, and you know, some chairs down there. But look at the stone. I mean, it's like the inside of a bank or, you know, or some you know, nice municipal building. Remarkable. So I found this, this is a great map and I forget is for one of the Yankee generals, but uh, I, I forgot who the car, cartographer was. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, post that reference later. But what's fabulous about it is lower right is Tunnel Hill. All right, that's the tunnel, you know, for the W and A down here. And then it's got it, it got all the bridges over the uh, the uh, East Chickamauga and the Chickamauga Creek. Mm. It's got the tunnel through Missionary Ridge, mm -hmm. you know, the, the uh, East Tennessee and Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then you get into Running Water Creek and there, and here's Whiteside. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, and I'm, I'm gonna blow this up in a little bit. Then you got the, the two huge bridges across the Tennessee River at Bridgeport, uh, the Memphis and Charleston, the National uh, Chattanooga meet in Stevenson. And then it even includes the upper, far upper left, the tunnel at Cowan, Tennessee. Mm. I mean, so uh, I mean, this, this is the, this is the whole world of Civil War Railroad, right? In, in this one map, it's just wow. incredible. So I'm, I'm gonna blow that up and blow it up again, but all right, now let me move my, my banner here is kind of in the way. All right, so over here to the right, uh, can you see my arrow? Yep. Okay, that's, that's the tunnel we're going to talk about. And then the white side trestle I talked about a couple weeks ago is here. And then there are all sorts of coal mines. I'm going to blow it up one more time, maybe. There you go. Oh, I didn't move this down. Um, all right, so I've blown it up for the last time, but 
so here's here's the tunnel we're talking about the mountain the closest mountain peak is still 800 feet higher than uh, this tunnel so the the national chattanooga was completed uh, i forgot exactly around 1854 or something like that and in the first few years they kept having huge landslides that buried the track on several occasions and on the last occasion uh, it was a slide that's about 500 feet long and 10 feet deep. And, and that's a lot of dirt. Mm. Uh, and so they estimated at almost 50,000 cubic yards. And it was, it, the landslide was so significant that they literally just laid track on top of the landslide. You know, just buried, you know, they left the, the original track just buried and then they put the track over it. But it changed the ruling grade. Uh, and so they had to use helpers uh, for a few years. And they, they finally decided that rather than daylighting a tunnel, they needed to bury a cut. And so this was a, a, a 40 foot cut and they decided to make a tunnel uh, there. Uh, let me... Wow. Was that before the Civil War or after? No, it's before, everything before. Uh, and uh, so Brainerd, he fit, that that guy. He he's unbelievable. He's he really is. He's a lot of fun to talk to. But he found where Stevenson, the president of the Nashville and Chattanooga, and uh, had you know he's offering twenty thousand dollars to somebody who will build him a tunnel through there. So he he actually found the the offer in the Chattanooga newspaper. Now some of y'all may know that Stevenson, the president of the Nashville Chattanooga, that. During the war, I think Nathan Bedford Forrest wanted to get his hands on him and, and choke him. Because right when, when Nashville was approached from the north, uh, the first train out of Nashville was carrying Stevenson's household and uh, <laughs> you know, his furniture and his slaves heading south. And so, and basically all the, uh, the supplies at Nashville were turned over without a fight. But anyway, that's, that's another story. All right. So that's, uh, and so that's, uh, you know, 2014. And uh, I had let my guard down and agreed to host the, uh, the convention here in 2000, I think it's 16 now. Correct. So let me show you this, the state of affairs uh, at that time. All right, so this, this thing's gonna go over a 15 foot, just plywood bridge. And that's where everything's going to happen. That's on the south side of my layout. So it's 10 feet over the stairwell and five feet before. So we, we really had nothing at the time. The, the one scene that was complete, uh, we had we'd done some of the trestle at Whiteside, and that was the first mural that we had done. Uh, so it's pretty naked as far as the tunnel area. So the first thing to do, uh, is to, you know, do your, decide uh, your track layout. And so this tunnel is over here on the right side. And uh, so he, here's the tunnel. The real one would have been six feet long at O scale. Uh, ours is three feet. And for the, all the bridges and tunnels, I tried to tilt them with respect to the room, you know, five to 10 degrees so you can look into them and you can take pictures, you know, uh, right down the barrel uh, for the big bridges and the um, tunnel. So this is what I decided on. I was going to need a 10-foot a, a table over the stairwell and then a little 5-foot table that coupled to that. And not working. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, there we go. So, uh, and you know, most of the layout is a two foot shelf layout. Yeah, uh, slightly. I'm sorry. Oh, it was a, a, a two foot shelf layout, but over the stairwell, uh, we bulged it out to make it a little bit bigger. And so we basically made a plywood box uh, that's stiffened by an I beam down the middle and then two C beams uh, on each edge. And everything is glued and screwed. Uh, this little plywood flange is not to support it, but just to, to be a, a safety in case our main support broke and that thing wouldn't go down the stairwell. All right. 
right? And this, this is Juve and Isaias. Uh, these guys actually helped build my garage when I, I put the original train room in. And so I got them to help me. Uh, uh, Juve is a real good carpenter. He's real good with the skill saw and the uh, table saw. And I was still an active surgeon at that time. I, I've tried to stay away from the table saw. But anyway, so they helped me build uh, these tables. And here's where they go. There's the, the stairwell. It's going to take a, almost a 10 foot table. And to the left of it will be kind of a freestanding five foot table. And we got this bay window, so I really can't connect to the wall back there. And this is what we came up with to uh, weld some supports uh, on the stairwell railing. Uh, and then there is a, a separate support for the, the, say, the left side of the five foot table. All right, so here's the 10 foot table over the stairwell. Mm. And then here's the little five foot table. Uh, and again, as the, as construction progresses, I, I'm cutting this plywood bridge down to whatever length. And I try to drive the trains as much as I can, you know, to, you know, see if everything's going to work. Um, all right. And, and so here you, on the left, you can see, we kind of have the provisional track. Uh, and this is fast. I use fast track, uh, and you know, everything's, you know, soldered up. Okay, and then I made a couple of kind of custom turnouts uh, to minimize the, the number of connections around the turnouts. Here we've begun to uh, kind of approximate the, the, the wing walls and the curved wing walls and the, uh, you know, tunnel portal and beginning to lay up foam on that. Here we're laying out, this is probably what's called Dry Creek. And it's over there uh, at the Tennessee River. It's just north of Nickajack Cave. And this is probably one of the columns that Hooker had coming across the Tennessee River. And there's a famous um, etching of some of his troops coming up through this draw. And so I wanted to, to have that as well. So we're beginning to get close on things. So on the dry creek, this is actually kind of looking at the back of it uh, yeah. on the left. And then you have to sculpt that out. But once you've kind of sculpted the road, uh, the banks, I use uh, a hacksaw yeah. turn, turn 90 degrees. Hang on. Uh, that, that works really pretty well to uh, kind of be surgical about uh, approximating these hills. All right, now I'm beginning to uh, play with the, the tunnel portal entrance. All right, so, you know, uh, I, I'm not worried about the inside of most of my buildings, uh, but this is one I wanted to go for the throat. I really wanted to do this one right. And so we literally measured the stones in the photographs and began approximating this thing. Jesus. And it would involve, you know, taking strips of basswood and making them kind of trapezoidal shape. Uh, and so we, this is how I originally kind of characterized it. And it yielded something like that. They had these kind of straight tangential sides coming off the arch. And that's not, re that's really not what was there. It was a true horseshoe. Uh, portal entrance, and so this is what I ended up with, and I think this is, this is right on it. Oh. Uh, most, uh, there are not many horseshoe <laughs> portals in the west. Most of them are in the east for whatever reason. All right, so really uh, the first thing are these curved retaining walls, and this finally smoked me out. I ended up having to uh, I bought a, a jigsaw that I'd been drooling over for about 10 years anyway. But to cut these things, I, I, a jigsaw was a natural way to do it. And so they're kind of like pork ribs that are interdigitated. And they interdigitate with the, the portal face as well as the, the, the straight or the flat um, retaining walls. And so here I, I've drawn them on 
uh, basswood, getting ready to cut them. And so the, it didn't occur, but I tried to preserve that the, the facets just like they were stones. And so they're about 36 of these guys. And then once I had them cut, then I would use their exact heights to lay out the, the portal face to, to get those stone heights, you know, the, the seam, the joint uh, correct. On here, I, I've begun uh, laying the thing up, interdigitating it. And here I am further along. So I've got the, the flat wing wall, the curved retaining wall, and all that has finger joints with the portal face. All right, to, that, was a, that was a bear of a layup. So I used a carpenter square and some machinist blocks and a, a lot of clamps. Uh, and you kind of have to do the whole corner at once. You know, you have to put all 12 or 13 pieces in at a time. All right. Now the, the tunnel itself, the lining of the tunnel are long um, strips of basswood and, uh, and John Turner that some of y'all met down here at the meet, previous meetings. Uh, he was real good on the table saw and I got him to cut these uh, very slight angles on the basswood strips. And this is, I don't know if this is the last one or the next to last one, but basically my index finger and my thumb had gone numb at this point from holding the chisel. And uh, so all we had to do was kind of dress the, the inside face of each strip. All right, now how to assemble the thing. Uh, so we needed to make a mandrel and uh, the kind of inner, inner part from here to here is the mandrel, okay? The, the false works is what they call it. And then I'm gonna build the, the tunnel around that or over that. And so basically in, in each of these um, bulkheads or whatever, the false works, they also have facets. I mean, they're, they're cut flat uh, on these faces and so I made four of these things and put them on a piece of um, poplar uh, as my tunnel form. And I would glue two of these strips together at, uh, just off the bench. And then I would uh, use twisted wire to, as a, a glue clamp uh, to glue pairs together. And as I'm laying this up, uh, I'm using clamps, not to, not to clamp to the false work, but just to use the false work to maintain the right shape. And uh, I'm sorry LeBron's not here because it really is a case of serving two masters. <laughs> you, really, you really can't do it, but I, I uh, so, because if, if everything is perfect in your measurements and cutting these strips, you wouldn't need to do that, but nothing's perfect. And so, is slightly over constrained to make it work. All right, so here I am uh, gluing that up. And you see these, so I'd, I would glue two or three strips together and those two or three strip packages, I would glue them together using this twisted wire technique. And this is the way, you know, you make a canoe if you do it a wooden strip canoe or something like that or, mm. or, or, or other boats, and it works great. So at the end, uh, you can see the, you know, the false work <coughs> over here in this left image, you know, is inside, and this mm. is the actual tunnel on the outside. And uh, this is an interesting shot. This is my, oh no, that isn't that one. Okay. But you actually looking down the, the barrel of that thing. All right. And in the, the last few strips, I had to use some canoe clamps over the top to hold them in. Jesus. All right. Um, I'm going backwards for some reason. Sorry. My fault. Oh, there we are. Uh, so here is the, the whole thing's glued up. Remember, it's not glued to the mandrel. That, that would go against you <laughs> if you did that. Um, and so this is, uh, so I finished the retaining walls and the portals and uh, uh, and again, and it, here's the tunnel between them. So that, that's the whole construct. All right, and then I slid the mandrel out and that's, that's my nephew, Will Shirey, who, who painted all my murals. 
Uh, he, he's a great artist. Uh, I use some um, piano wire pins to kind of hold things approximated, you know, uh, for eventual gluing. Mm. All right. And then, and then we painted the thing uh, to look like stone. And then we glued the, the, the portal ends to the tunnel. And we did that with just a single long threaded rod, like uh, for, for a screen door, something like that, just from the hardware store. And just put, you know, pure compression across both those faces. And actually, uh, Tom Raddis was, he, he came down to Memphis a couple of times uh, before the convention. And uh, so oh, here we are, we got the whole thing glued together. And there's Tom taking a lick on the, we did a trial fit with the, the scenery and everything went well. And so we decided it's time to feed Tom. So this is the arcade restaurant. This is Elvis's favorite restaurant. Uh, it's right there by the train station. Some of y'all may have seen it. And Tom had a uh, peanut butter and banana and bacon sandwich on uh, Texas toast. <laughs> that is not that big. I tell you, <laughs> seriously photoshopped. Yeah, <laughs> right. It, 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 it's in the foreground. It looks real big. But uh, all right. So this is just this is just maybe uh, six weeks before the uh, the convention was supposed to meet, and uh, you know the sheds on the pool table, the, uh, the scenery is on the ping pong table. There, there's no fascia. There's no switch controls. <laughs> but uh, so, so we decided to get after it. Uh, and we, I, I carved some um, abutments uh, for the through how truss. This is the scenery uh, on uh, Dry Creek pushed a little further. There's a through half truss bridge. All right, we're gluing the stringers in place. The track crew is working uh, to lay the last little bit of track up to the, the bridge and the tunnel. Uh, now we're, this is gluing the track down from the, the tunnel all the way to Nickajack Cave. Uh, there's 200 feet of fascia, and so I drew the short straw. I had to do all that, but so we templated and cut and sanded, primed and painted and glued uh, all that before y'all got down. Damn. And the controls are kind of a, a homemade thing, and some of y'all seen it. And I think it works real well. A uh, nice thing about it is you bump it. It doesn't. It doesn't break. It, it and it doesn't throw the switch either, uh, and it, it's pretty self-evident how to, how to work the things. It uses that airline or airplane control cables, you know, for RC planes and whatnot. This is my brother Harold. He's inspecting my track and my pit for the two turntables. This is this is two weeks before the meeting, and Harold through the year throughout that year had been working on uh, just a beautiful uh, copy or, of a Sellers turntable, you know, from that era. Uh, most of the turntables were made by Sellers, and he found the patent drawings, and so he made these out of brass. Uh, we used some gunsmithing fluid to, to blacken them, uh, but they just, they turned out great. And, I'm a, and so this is the uh, Roundhouse in Memphis, and so really, this this is literally a couple of days before the meeting. <laughs> but, uh, On time delivery. And we'll talk some other time about the turntable. But this this turntable will actually kind of drop its knee like a camel, the way they actually do. It has a little bit of rock to it, uh, and uh, that that's the way they were made. And Harold was able to come up with a mechanism to to do that. And so this other engine has called for the hostler to move the turntable for him. And you see how it rocks up as he gets on. Yeah. And then the, the engineer would kind of balance it. Uh, 
All right. And these are all uh, Dave Schneider locomotives. Uh, I mean, that's the reason why I think Bernie went into O. Same reason for me. They're, they're just uh, amazing uh, locomotives. That table is ridiculous. Okay. And we decided to all go celebrate after the turntable work. And uh, this is the rendezvous. That's Charlie Curro, who is my medical illustrator for uh, a long time, over 35 years. And uh, he's retired from medicine and from railroading. So that was a real loss to me, but he, he's a great guy. And, and the rendezvous says they want, they want the group to come back. Uh, and uh, if the convention comes back to Memphis, all right. So in closing, uh, this is the, the Nashville and Chattanooga's um, summit tunnel through Raccoon mm -hmm. Mountain. This is the, the south portal uh, heading towards Memphis. Uh, and, and I'm gonna close with this. And this is a, a train uh, going from Nashville to Chattanooga over Dry Creek uh, and through the tunnel. All right, and before I forget, uh, I, I think virtually every decoder I got uh, are uh, the soundtracks, the tsunamis, and the tsunami too. It's just it's an incredible uh, decoder. But uh, all right, I thank y'all for your attention. <laughs> Look, Charlie, Charlie, that was well done. Well done. That was absolutely fantastic. So, Charlie, you hand carved every one of those stones. Every one. Yeah, I had, I had, I had a, a numb thumb and forefinger from holding that chisel probably for six months. And, yeah. That's remarkable what you got done in four weeks, man. That is just remarkable. <laughs> God. So uh, thanks. Any, anybody have any question for Charlie? Okay. Good. Uh, I would just say that's, a, that's amazing. That's an incredible job. I'm thoroughly impressed by the work. Um, Great job. That, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, yep. Yeah. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Not bad for a first timer. Jesus. <laughs> and, and I, I'll tell you that early on, uh, I mean, I had a fair amount of science and uh, working with my hands and whatnot, but I was really intimidated by decoders. Uh, I don't know why I just was. And my first two locomotives, I did just motor only. And then uh, a friend of mine who I tried to, I tried to shame him into getting into sound, and he finally did. Uh, you know, John Turner, and right. and he he was he was great at it. He he was so good at it, and and you know it's kind of like sour apples that I don't need sound. You know, there's enough sound up here. I don't need sound, but man, once you have it, once you hear that chuff, it's just it's magic. It's a yeah, it's an addiction. So thanks again, Charlie. And I would like to take a second here and just introduce George. Uh, I know a couple of you know him, uh, but I, I remember meeting him on the phone once when I bur bur bought my first um, uh, microchip and I had no clue. And, you know, the thing that really resonated me with George is his accommodating style. I mean, the guy is just uh, so ready and willing to assist and support I've been on the phone with him a couple of times. And then a few months ago, I, I was watching this uh, uh, YouTube video, this guy, Ken Patterson, who does a really nice job. It's called What's Neat This Week. And I saw George on there. And then I saw him when he came out with the, uh, the Bachman locomotive. And then I don't know if you said it on the show, George, or if Charlie gave me a heads up on that, that you also have a, a side interest in the Civil War as well. And I thought, damn, we got to get this guy in here. So uh, welcome. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, George. All right. Well, thanks for letting me uh, spend the evening with you guys. Um, I'm, I'm still just be 
but just wowed by that tunnel. I mean, that's just amazing work. So um, we'll, we'll see if I can follow that. Um, but anyway, um, just a little bit on myself. Um, as we were kind of bantering a little bit at the beginning, um, I've been in the hobby really seriously since I was 14. Um, I kind of started working at the local hobby store uh, down in Texas, and that's kind of was my first um, real interest in getting into the layout and into the trains. Um, but I think it's always been kind of in my blood to be uh, in model railroading because my dad kind of had a passing interest in it. Um, we had some trains that we had inherited from my uh, grandfather, including one of the original Mantua 440s that was decked up like the general after they restored it um, and were running it back in the 60s. Um, so there's always been that side of me that really loves those type of locomotives. But I, I was, you know, for lack of a better term, I'll say a little bit of a purist and the tender drive drives me nuts. Um, you know, for whatever reason, I realized that, you know, especially modeling in HO scale, it's somewhat of a, a uh, for lack of a better term, a necessary evil. But um, so I, I, you know, I kind of played around with some stuff here. And, and back in Texas, I had my main layout in the garage. It was in a two car garage that, as you can see behind here, I model 1978 Missouri Pacific. Um, partially because that's what I grew up with, but there's there's going to be a, a bigger layout that's going to be running from uh, the White River route. It's a really scenic section of the Missouri Pacific, kind of like Rocky Mountain scenery, but with the trains that I've collected and grown up with for years. But at one point, I was planning to build a small layout in our spare bedroom that was just a shelf layout, kind of like this, but it was going to be based all on Civil War era. And it was going to be, of course, a, a modeled era of the the locomotive chase mm. um, with the general and the Texas and, and all the stuff in between and kind of model, you know, similar to the way I guess Disney told the story. Um, I always kind of appreciated that and loved it. And, and I've always liked these locomotives. And I will say on my side of it, um, I have scrapped probably about three of the original Bachman 440s trying to find a way to cut and put a motor inside that thing. Um, so you know, it's it's always been that way. But when, you know, working the soundtracks, we had partnered with Bachman. And when they were announcing these, that they had come up with the tender drive, I was so excited. I couldn't wait to get them in my hands. And I actually have two of them. This one is the first one that was really kind of, it's stock paint for, for lack of a better thing on it. But I did do quite a bit of detailing on it. And just to kind of start it off, I'll show you a little bit of what the work I did to it. But one of the first things I'm hoping this comes through clear enough was I had cut the wood load off yep. the top because that yep. wood load kind of looked like a pile of, well, something you would flush. So, <laughs> um, so I wanted it to look a lot more accurate. So I cut that out, lowered the deck, replaced the deck on here, and then just used real tree branch, cut wood and, you know, cut it in half and then glued it together. And now that, that also hides the holes for the speaker. So the speaker terminal, the speaker is right there. And so it hides that. Um, but with the lowered tender deck, of course, I had less room to do anything with it. So there's actually a Tsunami 1100 and a current keeper in that tender deck. Wow. Somehow um, it fits. Wow. But one of the things I really did, and I'll see if I can pull it apart here so maybe you guys can see it, but I de detailed a lot of the interior of the cab. So there's some gauges, there's some levers in there, and of course a crew. Jeez. And then just did some minor detail on the outside of this thing. We put the pull cord for the bell, yep. the pull cord for the for the replacement whistle, and then of course replaced the pilot. That ugly big giant coupler sticking out of the front of it just didn't look right. And these are all precision scale parts. And the 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 um, draw bar, the coupler rod is draw bar is loose. It's a separate part right. that's held in place with a lift pin. So, but you replace the water pump on the side of it because of course there's no injector in this era so right. went through a little bit of an extensive work in the tent and the uh the stack is a 3d printed stack that i found on shapeways nice work so it was uh so i was having a little bit of fun with this one but one of the th reasons like now i lost my draw bar there we go <laughs> um one of the reasons i wanted to do this was because now i had a a 10 i mean a locomotive drive model 
And, and with the tsunami too, this was all coming out about the same time. And what was really fascinating to me about it was with over 50 different sound effects that we've built into this decoder, I can more accurately represent this than anything I've ever been able to do. Mm. Um, we've got 90 different whistles programmed into the decoder. So that's, it's, it's just a matter of CV selection. And there's a handful of single chime, three chime, five chime, six chime whistles. And I know most of those were kind of single chime back in the day, but I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty loud given the fact that it's right there. Mm -hmm. So you go through and you just select the different whistles that you want to choose from. Um, and then of course, this era we had hand rung bells. And so with each bell record, with each bell choice, you have a difference in ring rates and they're designed to represent a hand rung bell all the way up to a modern, you know, air ringer. But for this one, we just kind of go with the really heavy brass bell at a slow hand rung rate. And all of this is selectable just by CV. So when you purchase the decoder, you're going to select steam and all these sounds that we're going to talk about tonight are preloaded in there. You just make a couple of CV adjustments with your throttle and I can make this decoder follow this model or a big boy challenger, whatever. It's all the same decoder. Wow. So it's all preloaded in there. And the idea is that it makes it easy for you as the user so that you literally just put it on the track, make your couple of CV adjustments and you're back playing with it instead of having to spend an hour or more in front of a computer downloading software and firmware. And then you become the end of the quality control because you can't test the blank disc. Right. And our technicians in our factory that we build our stuff in, in Durango, Colorado here, uh, we hand test every one of our locomotive or every one of our decoders before they're packed up and shipped out. So, you know, you're getting a quality product. What's the, so, what's the decoder that you, you're re referencing? Now, now, is that? No, this is the Tsunami 2. Oh, it is. Great. Um, it's the Tsunami 2 family. Um, what's in this guy is the TSU 1100. And it's a small decoder. It's probably about, you know, the length of your pinky or the size of your pinky. It's, it's uh, about three eighths of an inch wide by about an inch long. So it's designed small enough to fit into an in-scale <clears throat> narrow hood diesel. Um, but for you O-scale guys, we do have the TSU 2200, which gives you up to two amps of stall current. Uh, and again, all this stuff is in there. And then you've got six different lighting effects. And I'll talk about lighting effects uh, here in a little bit, because I've got a really cool one here for this non-electric light. Um, so when you're going through and you're looking at this, there's a whole handful of things you want to look at. Um, of course, in the early uh, Civil War era, there wasn't a whole lot of air compressors um, and air brakes on it. It were a lot of the time still manual levers. Um, so that's one of the things, every one of the sound effects has its own volume control. So you can reduce uh, the volume on say, like your air compressor, so it's not there. But if you do have one of the early brake, ses uh, brake systems that's on there, like for example, um, I, it may be retrofitted, but the Eureka and Palisades uh, 440 that used to come here to Durango all the time has a single, uh, single phase air compressor on the side of it. Um, so you can go through and select a CV to determine which air compressor sounds play in addition to you can have the volume control for each one. So when you look at these locomotives, you kind of look at what all you've got there. And, you know, these, we, we've got nine different uh, I'm sorry, 10 different exhaust chups that are programmed into the decoder. You have three light, which is most of what we would be looking for for these type of things, because really what you're looking for is the cylinder size and the boiler size. And then I'll get into the blower here in just a second. But you have the cylinder size and that's tend to be what you're going to hear. So you've got the three lights, the three medium, the three heavy, and then you have a geared uh, or a geared locomotive that's going to be kind of more of a deeper woofing sound because um, they're a lot different cylinder size. Wow. But all that's just, again, you selectable by a CV. And then the advantage to the chuff on the Tsunami 2, one thing that we did over the original Tsunami was the original Tsunami, the chuff rate was based on the throttle setting. So when I set the, lo the throttle to go to, say, speed step 10, your decoder may, may create uh, 1.2 chuffs per, rev per uh, second or whatever it is. Uh, per and, and so that was based on timing. But when you started going uphill, your train may slow a little bit because you've got cars behind it and so forth. Well, so the chuff would continue at its rate, but your locomotive may be physically slowed as it's working up. So it kind of became a mismatch of the chuff rate versus the 
rotations of the driver. And so it made uh, things like a, a cam, a chuff cam necessary. Mm. Now our Tsunami 2 actually is a, uh, it's a, uh, it, think of it like a digital cam. It's actually watching the rotations of the motor using its back EMF uh, readings and it can identify a rotation of the motor. So wow. when you set a chuff rate, it's actually mock marking the motor and saying, okay, now instead of uh, 1.2 chuffs per second, now I'm creating 1.2 chuffs per revolution of the motor or whatever it is, or it takes 1.2 revolutions of the motor to create a chuff. So on this locomotive here real quick, I'll, I'll just move forward here and we'll just kind of speed step three. So you can kind of see how it's, it's, you hear the chuff, but then we have a feature called dynamic exhaust. So now when the locomotive has some resistance, you can hear that chuff become a little louder as the locomotive is working against my hand. Uh. And so the dynamic exhaust will actually read that load on the motor and adjust the chuff sound intensity. So same thing, if you're coasting downgrade, you'll hear that chuff intensity back off quite a bit. And all of this is calibrated so it matches your model. Um, in, this, in, these mod, in these locomotives, it's a coreless motor. So as you can see, I mean, it's fairly accurate even at, and, and especially gives you extremely well, uh, extremely good slow speed uh, control. Huh. Now, when you're selecting the chuff, one of the other sounds you hear, now the Tsunami 2 has over 50 different sound effects built into it. And then you have 16 sound channels that all the sounds play. And so what that does is it helps recreate a realistic um, uh, profile of what you're going to hear from the real locomotive. Uh, for example, some of the competitor stuff, when you turn on the bell, the air compressor sound mysteriously disappears. The reason for that is because the bell is a warning device and so it's prioritized. So the other decoder has, because of the limited sound channels, has to cut off the compressor. Well, with 16 independent sound channels, we can play all those sounds prototypically and realistically so that you don't have to have those sounds disappear. So like, say for example, if you have an oil burner, you're gonna hear that sound of the atomizer, even though you're blowing the whistle, ringing the bell and chuffing down the, down the tracks. So all of those sounds are gonna play. And so what you're hearing right now uh, I'm assuming these sounds are coming through, by the way, because I'm just on my headphone. Yep. Um, but the that's the sound of the blower. And the blower is a small ring of, of uh, that sits right below the stack. And what it does is it takes that steam pressure and injects it out the stack. The reason it's doing that is because that's how the draft is created when the locomotive is sitting still. Because you have the firebox <laughs> and... That, fire, that heat has nowhere to go, so it would eventually snuff itself out. So this creates the draft. Now, when your locomotive's running, the chuffing coming out of there is what's creating the draft and drawing that heat forward through the flues. And God. so the blower sits there and does this sound, and so you'll hear this. And so when you see a steam locomotive sitting there and you're hearing that hissing, it's not just the locomotive. That's actually doing uh, something on the locomotive, and that's – that's the advantage of where we live, being in Durango. we have right next door to one of the largest steam locomotive fleets in the country. And so when it comes to operating a steam locomotive, we go down the street and we ask the guys, hey, what's this? Hey, what's that? And I will say right at this moment, I'm kind of don't have anybody. But at the time we built the Tsunami 2, all the way up until Josh, who was our normal tech support, uh, had to move away because of his family, we have had uh, steam railroaders on staff. And so wow. they could tell us exactly what it is. So when our sound engineers would go to work to design the software for the, how the decoder worked, they would go ask the railroad engineers, hey, how does this feature work? Mm -hmm. And so we would get a more realistic experience of what all those sounds are and how the, how the locomotive works. Remarkable. Now, Did, on one of the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, so, so were the sounds recorded? I mean, how do you get the sounds? We actually go out and re-record real locomotives. And so, like say for example, when we hear this whistle, what you're actually hearing is you're hearing three sound clips played together. So our, our software, I mean our audio engineers will go out and record a locomotive and they'll record these whistles, bells, uh, exhaust chuffs, in the case of a diesel locomotive, the diesel engine idling and so forth. And what the engineers will do is when they come back with the raw audio, 
they'll slice it up into sections that the decoder plays through its, its memory chip. And what it is, is the whistle is actually three sections. You have the attack, which is the sound of the whistle valve opening. You have what's called the sustained, which is a loop sound. It's the sound that plays over and over and over again, as long as you're holding that button down. And then you have the decay, which is the sound of the whistle valve closing. Uh. Our audio engineers, their task is to come in and take those, that raw audio and slice it up so that you and I, as the operators, will never hear it transfer from one sound file to the next. So that that way you get that realistic experience and you still get that instantaneous response. So when I blow the whistle here, you're hearing it, but you don't hear it looping. To us, it sounds like it's blowing the whistle. And then when we release, you hear it go into that decay. Right, right. And so that's one of the, the advantages of using our technology that we've been doing this for years is because we have the experience and we can go through and take these sound files. And you usually, for, with a raw recording, it'll take about two days to finally engineer it and get it down to where we can all listen to it and nitpick it and send them back to the uh, lab with, with tips and, and suggestions to make it better. Because um, after a few days when you're listening, especially to a diesel engine, you go home and to, to bed at night and they're hearing that diesel engine in their head. So um, as one can imagine, and so a whistle would be the same way. Right, right. Um, so, but that's kind of, but all of our sounds are all recorded <laughs> off of real locomotives. So when you go in and you hear it, you're actually hearing that raw audio, but it's sliced up in such a way so that it, the decoder plays those sounds as appropriate so right. that you and I get the impression that we're hearing the real thing. Remarkable. Um, one of the cool things that you talked about that that was really resonating is how the decoder is actually at the effect of the motor versus something that's already programmed and digitized. So there's a relationship between mm -hmm. the decoder and the locomotive, correct? Correct. And so the decoder kind of knows from the locomotive what the sounds are and how to play it and all of it's interactive. So like, say, for example, I was talking about the air brakes. So the F F11 is our air brake application. And I realize air brakes are probably a little further down the line. I think they were developed somewhere in like the 1880s and so forth. Um, but with, uh, with our decoders, you've got two braking systems on every locomotive. You have the independent, which as its name implies, are the brakes that are actually on the locomotive. Then you have the automatic or the train brake, and that's the air hose that goes from car to right. car and distributes that braking effort. Right. Our decoder is able to reproduce both with an actual braking rate. So you can actually use it to start and stop the locomotive independent of the throttle. Now, where the sounds are played interactive is when you use the brakes more frequently, well, you're depleting your air reservoir. So what happens? The compressor has to be triggered to recharge the air, to air reservoirs. And all of these are done So when you, you to, together. So when you use the brakes more frequently, you'll hear that compressor cycle. Right. So okay. these are all sounds that are interactive based on how you use it. So just for example here, I'm going to go ahead and move the locomotive forward. And I I'm, don't remember, because I've been doing a lot of, of demonstrations with this thing lately. So bear with me a second. I'm going to make sure I have some momentum in here. And make sure that I can show you the braking rate. I got to do math real quick. Hold on. Got a few of those here. <laughs> okay, so now when I start to move my locomotive, I'm going to jump to speed step 10. So as I'm running, you can hear that dynamic exhaust taking over. But when I apply the F11, you hear the squeal. Yeah. Locomotive comes to a stop, but on my throttle, I'm still moving at speed step 10. Right. And so I can use the brakes to actually run my train. So I change directions, release the brakes. And because I took away the air compressor, there's no air release. So you're actually seeing and hearing the brake squeals. That's cool. So, right. cool. but... But this is all, you know, like I said, these are all some of the things that we built into it, kind of thinking ahead of what are the different types of locomotives that we would encounter. Right. So in this case, the brake release and the brake application are separate volume settings, as uh, opposed to just having one generic brake sound. And then, of course, the automatic brake has its own volume setting as well. 
would this be a good time to, I don't want to interrupt if you're on a, on a roll here, but I was going to see if anybody had any questions at this point. Oh, go ahead. Cause I've got a, just a couple more things I was going to touch on and then open the floor to questions. Cause I want to show you the, the, the lighting that I came up with for the headlight and then uh, talk about the type of fuels that are being used in the locomotives. Got it. So, so if anybody's got any questions, fire away. I got a question. Oh, Bernie. Okay. Does that locomotive have a cam to synchronize exhaust? It does not. And that's, that's one of the advantages of the Tsunami 2 is it's actually watching the rotations of the motor. So when you set your chuff rate, typically what I recommend is get the locomotive moving about speed step five or six or seven, somewhere around there that you can actually watch and count with it. And then when you increase the chuff rate or decrease the chuff rate, the decoder is essentially marking the motor and will identify how many rotations are then going to trigger a chuff. So every time, no matter whether you're moving forward, reverse, uphill, downhill, if the locomotive slows, you'll actually uh, hear the chuff rate slow. So like, for example, here, I'm going to start moving again and forward. Um, but when I come to a stop, you hear the chuff stop. As I'm moving it, you can hear the chuffing going on but it's just watching the rotations in the motor. It actually has nothing to do with a cam or any physical wire or anything. Um, that's, that's cool. I, I will say that, you know, um, I, I jokingly tell people this. I, I, I think of it like an AA meeting. Hello, my name is George and I'm a former cam user. Um, <laughs> because I was one of those that was very meticulous. I mean, I went so far as to research I had a uh, uh, HO scale Challenger that I had for years, and the 3985 is one of my favorite locomotives, of course, as you would imagine. But I went so far as to try to find a different tooth worm gear so that the front and rear drivers would turn just slightly out of sync so that I could put a cam on each set of drivers and get that exact chuff every single time. And this was, this was a feature that I wanted to make sure worked correct before we eliminated the hardware for a cam because I know how I am and I'm a lot like a lot of you guys out there, uh, whether it be you guys here or in the modeling community where we have to have that exact right. And uh, this was something that I was stickler on and we nailed it. And so I said, okay, I'm perfectly happy with that, with that, uh, with that setup. So, um, Got it. you know, so yeah, I, that was something I was very adamant about. And so if it didn't work, I wasn't, I wasn't going to let them not put cam hardware on there. DC, did you have a question? Uh, I'll, I'll wait to the end. Okay. Okay. Good. So we'll, so we'll pick it up at the end. Go ahead, George. Okay. So there's a CV in here and CV number 112, where you can adjust uh, the type of fuel that's being used. You can decide the articulation, uh, the type of chuff cadence, whether it's a conventional rod articulated or a three cylinder. So if you're modeling shays and things like that, you can add that third cylinder into there. Um, you can also do a manual versus a power reverse. Again, a power reverse is going to be probably a lot later than anything we're talking about here, but it's an air powered reverse as the locomotives got bigger. So you can set up all of that, but when, you know, with, with the, the fuel selection, we have wood, uh, hand shoveled coal, auger fed coal, and then oil burning with an atomizer. And one of the functions we have, function 17, is fuel loading. And so when you select the fuel, it changes which recording plays when you select and when you load. So in this case, a wood burning locomotive here, uh, hopefully it'll come through clean enough on my uh, headphones here. But when I select fuel loading, you're basically going to hear wood being thrown onto a wood pile and I'll shut up long enough so hopefully you can hear it. It's a very subtle sound, but it's there. Yeah. Barely hear it, but I, yeah, I've heard it on mine. Yeah, I get it. So it gives you That's that wild. ability. And then um, when Fireman Fred shovels coal, you'll actually hear Fireman Fred throwing wood onto a crackling wood fire. And again, you can adjust the volume of this. It's, it's not something you would typically hear from say, you know, 100 yards away from a locomotive, but it's there and it's a really neat effect. Um, and then of course, there's always taking on water, which is fuel uh, function 16. And, um, and I know in the coal version, I don't remember if it's on the wood or not, but shaking the grates uh, on the, for the ash pan cleaning. 
um, is on function 18. So those are some of the sounds that we built into it. Wow. And so the, the last thing without, because I could talk for this for like two or three hours. Um, I give, I have a, a clinic that I put together that I'm actually kind of cheating right now and using it to kind of help remind me what the talking points are. But I have an hour long presentation that we've done that's just operating steam locomotives. Ooh. So I'm kind of using that as a guide. I'm not going to go into the full detail tonight, um, but there you can find that on our YouTube channel. Perfect. On that's YouTube. What I ask. And I'll and I'll cover all that stuff here, where you guys can find the resources and things like that. Because I know there's a couple of you guys that may be new at DCC. Um, for example, I think it was Charlie was saying he was a little apprehensive getting into the electronic stuff. So with that regard, we have videos on there that'll get to the to the beginner. So I'll cover that here in just a second. But this was something I want to show. I'm I'm like, this is one of my favorite things about this locomotive, and it's so simple and it's so stupid, but it's freaking cool. And here's what it is. We like so it. when when we designed the tsunami two, we added. I'm gonna shut them up for a second. Um, we added some lighting effects and. I'm a lighting guy. One of the things I love to do, and part of the reason I model diesels is because of all the lights that are all over it. Um, I have a few modern locomotives. I don't know if you can see the one behind me here. Um, but this guy here has 22 LEDs in it. Jesus. So that's, a, that's an illness. That's an illness. So I'll leave that alone. Um, but anyway, lighting is a very important thing. And so when we added some of the cool lighting effects, we added things like constant dim. Uh, on off constant dim where you can have things like number boards or in this case a cab light or something like that that's on but just a little bit dimmer so it doesn't look like a headlight. Um, we added things like a different rotary beak I mean a, a different strobe so that like on a modern locomotive you can get two strobe lights that will go in and out of sync with each other. So it's some adding some of these cool lighting effects well one of them I hadn't really put a whole lot of effort into was the ash pan light oh. and an ash pan light is kind of a glowing change because as you know your locomotive's going, you kind of get that 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 draft we were talking about. So you get a little bit of that slight flickering. Well, when I was doing this locomotive, one of the things we have on our steam decoder is called a dynamo. It's electric driven, I'm sorry, it's a steam driven electric generator that lights up the lights. Well, in this era, we didn't have a dynamo on the locomotive. So you take that and you mute it, but now what do you do with a light? You have either a solid light or prior, it was a flickering firebox. Not really gonna give you a really cool effect. And I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. One of the guys, one of my uh, audio engineers said, because I was putting this together and I was talking to him about it and he says, why don't you use the ash pan light? Well, that's a cool idea. Put it on there and by God, it looks awesome. So I'm going to hope it comes through clearly here. I'm going to show it to you. But basically, instead of a solid light, you'll notice a slight flickering. So with the current keeper here, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to bring it over to the camera. So hopefully it'll come through clean enough. But instead of a solid light, you can kind of see a little bit of a flickering. So it looks like oh, that yeah. oil light of yeah. that era. Right. Oh, that's very cool. So now we've got that unique capability to be able to do wow. something like this prior to, you know, electric lights. Now we have something that can simulate an oil light on a locomotive. That's and that's, so that's one of the reasons that the tender drive is gone. I'm, I keep looking at this thinking uh, it's time for me to maybe get back into it and uh, start looking more at the uh, Civil War era. <clears throat> but one of the one of the things I will say is I'm not a graphic artist. I cannot draw for anything. And one of the things that always I love about these locomotives of this era was the ornate, the leaf, bold leaf work and the, the drawings and stuff that are on the sides of the sand dome, the steam dome, on the corners of the tender. And so I have a, a, a vision in my mind that at some point I'm going to do a version of one of these uh, sort of fictional just because I can but I want to have pictures of my grandparents on the, like on the steam dome and stuff and on the corners of the tender shell, you know, where they would have those pictures on those locomotives of the era. So at some point I will probably end up modeling a little bit more of this, but for now, this is everything I've got uh, for that era and I'm having fun with it, but I don't have anything to pull it yet right. or to pull with it yet. That's great. 
You, are you familiar with John Ott, George? Uh, I actually have been on his website several times. Um, yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. And it's one of those things that I wish I had more time to sit and just, because I could get lost on his website very easily. Yeah, we have. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, man. That was good. So, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, before I open it up to questions, did you want to give us uh, some places, locations to go oh, to to see? Yes. So uh, every week we post a short little three to five minute video about certain features of the decoder uh, that's on our YouTube channel. So you can go to it from soundtracks.com, uh, look for the YouTube icon, click on it, it'll take you right to our channel. Um, the other option is uh, you can go to youtube.com and just search soundtracks videos. Um, and so there's a lot of good information. We've taught, you've, you'll see this guy in a lot of these short videos um, and things like that. But one of the things I wanted to talk about as far as like for, for new users, and I've been talking to a lot of them over the last several months since Josh left, but the, um, the webinar series, uh, these, there's 14 videos to it right now. Um, the first three are just kind of a steam overview, a diesel overview, and then an operations overview. Because at that point, we wanted to kind of sell you on the idea of Tsunami. But then we get into other topics of, you know, that aren't necessarily soundtracks related, such as webinar number four is just what is DCC and how does it work? Mm. And the idea behind that is, you know, when I was, when I had, before I had the purple name on my shirt or the, the name on my purple shirt here, I was the DCC guru. Um, and after being into the industry, mm. I didn't know crap. <laughs> and there's a lot of myths. There's a lot of misunderstandings out there. And so, you know, the webinars are designed to kind of teach you what's going on. So webinar number four, what is DCC and how does it work? Yes, it sounds very fundamental and it is, but we actually show you the little green man behind the curtain. Mm. We show you what's actually going on and the, and the relationship between your DCC <clears throat> system and the, the decoder. And we talk about what that communication protocol looks like. Right. Um, then webinar number five is just about audio, what makes good sound. You know, what, what is a uh, baffle? Why do you need a baffle and, and things like that? Um, webinar six is another one I recommend people to because it talks about CV programming. What is CV programming? What are we actually doing? And then we cover some of the other myths and so forth of DCC, like nobody can program on the main line. That's foreboding. And it's not. It's, no. But it's because a lot of people don't know what's actually happening. So we talk about that kind of stuff. Um, the last one I'll highlight is webinar, well, second to last one, is webinar number nine. Um, webinar nine definitely takes it away out of our hands and says, this is absolutely zero to do with soundtracks. We take the three major DCC systems and teach you how to use it. Mm. Um, so for example, a mm. lot of people, when they have a power cab, well, they can figure out how to run a train and blow the whistle and ring the bell. But when it comes to doing something like function 17 fuel loading, how do you do it? And we don't, you know, it's not intuitive to find that button. And let's face it, we're guys. We don't read instructions. <laughs> you know, <Ow>. so, <laughs> so the idea is that the, with this video, we can teach you how to use this thing because we get a lot of calls and I'll tell somebody, uh, they'll say, hey, how do I do X, Y, Z? Oh, it's really easy. Just program this CV to this and you'll get it. And then there's that in an inexplicable silence of, well, how do I do that? Right. You know, because, okay, well, that's great, but they don't know how to use this thing. So webinar nine teaches you this. And then um, the last one I'll mention is webinar number 10 is that, that video or that uh, uh, in-depth overview of steam operation. And I'll just grab my iPad really quickly here and just kind of, you know, we go through all the different sound effects and talk about you know what each of them are you know, we talk about what working the cutoff is you can use the f5 and the f6 to manually adjust the cutoff of the steam uh chuff so you can actually adjust the travel or simulate anyway adjusting the travel of the uh of the cylinder and the pistons um talk about drifting talk about wheel slip you know dynamo and lights cylinder cocks blow down valve all these different things we talk and so this goes into detail talks about what an injector is um, so this video is webinar number 10. 
and uh, you can see that on our YouTube channel. And the best part about it is, is, is it's free. You don't have to pay or you don't have to do anything. You just go onto YouTube and watch it. And those webinar videos are about 35 to 45 minutes long, um, depending on the topic, but they are in depth. And then as if anybody has a question, we're a phone call or an email away if, uh, if you get stuck or need help. You're the man. So That's great. Fabulous presentation, man. Thank you so much. That was energizing. I'm ready to get back into my locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great to hear. So, uh, any other questions? I do. Yeah, I I do. Question. Jerry. Sure. I got a little gear motor here. And okay. it's rated it's rated for 12 volts. It okay. costs two dollars and seventy nine cents on eBay. And mm -hmm. it'll fit in an HO scale Yona. Oh wow, and, okay. And it'll uh at, uh, at 12 volts, the output shaft's supposed to spin about 150 RPM, which is about the right speed for that locomotive. How do I know if this will work on DCC? It, Biggest thing uh, is you want to you want to measure what's called stall current, and stall current is what the motor draws when the shaft is stopped at full okay. voltage. The reason is, and we hear this a lot. This is a, one of the myths that we talk about, but stall current is important because a DCC decoder uh, works differently to control a motor than our traditional DC power pack. Um, when we have a power pack, we turn the throttle up, it increases the voltage on the rail, train goes faster. Pretty simple stuff. But a decoder controls the motor using what's called pulse width modulation. I'm sure you guys have all heard this term. Uh, pulse width modulation, basically to describe it a little bit <clears throat> differently, it sends momentary pulses of full track voltage, but for short periods of time. The, what PWM does, pulse width modulation, it modulates or changes the width or duration of the pulse based on your throttle setting. So let's say you're, and, and to illustrate this, let's say uh, you're at quarter throttle. You know, speed step, uh, I don't know what it is, it's like 32 out of 128. Your decoder power is being sent to the motor on for 25% of that second, and then off for 75% of that second. As you go to 50% throttle, it's on for half of that second and off for half the second. Right. And that's, that's how it's controlled. So the reason stall current is important is because when you go from zero to speed step one, that motor is seeing that instantaneous pulse of 14 volts or 16 volts, whatever's on your track. And then it turns off and then it turns back on and it turns back off again. Well, during that stop, during when that first power is stop is applied, the motor stopped or stalled, and so it draws the most amount of current. As that motor starts to turn, now the now the consumption goes down significantly. So this is why stall current is important. So to measure your mo your motor, there's two ways to do this: apply full DC power and stop the shaft which may or may not be ca physically capable to do with all the gearing in there. Um, but, if you, but when you stop it, in one of the leads of the wires, you're gonna have a, 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 a ammeter hooked up and it's gonna be measuring DC amps. And at some, when that motor stops, you're gonna see that meter rise and then use the highest reading you get. Start and stop it a couple of times and use the highest reading. So that motor there, I'm gonna guess is probably about seven tenths of an amp. Um, so a one amp decoder like the TSU 1100 will be perfect. Um, option number two, which is a little bit easier of a way, but it takes math, um, measure the resistance across the motor leads. Spin the motor, do it again. Use, in this case, the lowest reading. So let's say we get eight ohms across our motor. Well, when we put it on a 16 volt system, that's, you know, we plug it into Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times resistance. Excuse me. Um, so in this case, voltage is 16 volts. So current is what we're trying to determine times eight, eight, eight ohms. So to solve for current, we divide 16 by eight, we get two. So that current draw is now two amps. That would say the TSU 1100 would not be able to work for it. So I would suspect on a motor like that, you'll probably get somewhere between 16 and 20, uh, 20 ohm resistance on it. Um, is what I'm guessing. 
Um, I don't have one of those, obviously, but that's where I would guess it to be. But that's why we measure it is because of the way the motor is being controlled by the decoder. Got it. That helped, Jerry? You hear, you'll hear yeah. a lot of times, sorry, I'll just throw in one last thing. You'll hear a lot of times people will talk about slipping current, and that's where the wheels are spinning on the reels or on the rails. And the reason they do that is because they say, well, I've never locked up my motor drive before. I always make sure my mechanism is fluid. Well, that's fine, but that's not why we measure it. Yes, that could happen, but that's not why it's measured. It has to go with the way the decoder controls the motor. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks. Okay. Does it matter if it's a, a brush motor or a cordless motor? Or... No. No? Okay. No, the decoder can calibrate. I mean, this is a cordless motor inside this thing. That's the only way they get a motor small enough to fit in this. Right. Uh, DC. Did that, did that start out as a, a regular DC engine or DCC? Yes. Okay. This and started it off as a DC engine that I took and gutted everything in the tender, including the weights, because I modified the inside so much that I hardwired everything to the six pin connector between the locomotive and tender. And then I used uh, that A-line moldable lead to put the weight back in the tender. Okay. Did, um, so it's still a tender drive engine or did you? Mm. No, this okay. is a locomotive drive. The, lo the motor's in the locomotive. That's what I was saying. Okay. The tender drives drive me nuts. So you can kind of see here. Um, okay. Let me see if I can get them separated. There's no. I see. There's okay. no motor between there. Oh, the motor's completely in here. And the motor actually, I was actually impressed with the way they did this because as, as I was talking about, I detailed the interior. So there's actually enough room here that the motor is just under this, you know, this first part of the steam under the steam dome here. Wow. So okay. it's actually gives me a cab interior. Okay. What type of a speaker do you use, did you use? Um, on this particular locomotive, it's a 20 millimeter round. And what I did was I put it underneath, as I mentioned at the beginning, I replaced this tender deck with a piece of styrene that I had drilled holes in. Okay. And so the wood hides the holes. And then the 20 millimeter speaker is actually underneath uh, secured to the underside of that tender deck with uh, uh, one of our uh, pre-cut laser gaskets and then the decoder and current keeper fit underneath of it. Nice. All right, cool. Charlie. Uh, what did you use for uh, your six pin connector on that? Um, this is one that came with it. So the six wire connector came with it, but we do have a product in our product line called a DBX 9000 and um, it's a nine wire locomotive to tender connector. This was something I was searching for long before I had the name on my shirt. And I had actually fabricated a couple out of some PCB board and some test harnesses I got from JST. And, uh, and I told them, I said, we need to make this as a product. They said, okay. So it actually is about the same size as this nine wire connector, um, but it gives you nine wires. So that's two for track, two for motor, uh, two for your headlight. And then it gives you three extra wires for things like extra lights, or in some cases, I've actually mounted a speaker inside the locomotive so that it doesn't sound like the sounds coming out of the tender. Wow. Is the, your, uh, your headlight, that you didn't actually replace the headlight, it's all in the decoder, right? Correct. Okay. Correct, that's one of the lighting effects. So I just changed the CV and selected ash pan light. And the one thing I will say is this is a LED um, so you have to add the LED compensation. It's not because it changes the voltage, so you do still need the resistor, but what it does is it changes the way the signal is sent through the wires. Um, uh, the decoder controls all the lighting effects the same way it does the motor, PWM, pulse width modulation. But an LED has different illuminating properties, the light, unlike uh, different than a light bulb. And so what the LED compensation does is it changes the way that signal is sent through the wires so that that LED appears more animated. Wow. So that way your LED will have that, that slight flickering. But if I had left it without the LED compensation, you may not even be able to see it. So you it doesn't change that much. So, so you would recommend having LEDs as the headlight versus the standard incandescent bulb, right? Uh, I am converting everything to LEDs. So I will say that, yes, I recommend that. I'm not gonna say by any stretch of the imagination that you have to do that. But the advantage to it is the LEDs last forever. One of the biggest uh, hurdles for LEDs was size and color. 
and we've got so many different colors now. Um, I'm finding that I'm getting that that golden white and that pure white kind of more what I would want to see out of a model. And if this uh, headlight or if this LED ever fails, then I'll take it apart and replace it with an 0402 and then maybe even do a little casting inside there that makes it look like it's actually the oil lamp base and then stick the 0402 LED up out of the bottom of it. So what's wow. the number of that LED again? Uh, 0402. It's a, uh, it has to do with the chip size. Um, we, we looked at trying to add them into our product line, but I can't buy them for less than a dollar or two a piece um, in bulk. And then by the time you add labor markup and so forth, it doesn't become profitable at that point. So we're still looking, but you can buy them on eBay um, and some of these places. There's one that I've bought from recently called Lighthouse LEDs. They're based up in the Seattle area, I think. Um, but he buy, he, you can buy them pre-wired and he has different shades of white. So there's the golden white, the, the sunny white, and uh, I don't remember if those are his terms or not, by the way, so don't quote me on that. Duh. But um, there's different shades of them, so you can get them to match whatever. And then, of course, there's reds and greens and oranges and stuff like that. And so um, probably one of the next ones I'll add to the firebox flicker and replace the connector so I have that access. Wow. You, is the LED compensation something you select on the... Yes. Okay. It's, it's not another product you have to put like a nope. current keeper or something like that? No. So the way the light works is the you select the lighting effect and that's a value. I think it's like zero to 23 or 25. I forget exactly off the top of my head now. Um, but then you have some modifiers. You have what's called phase. And this is where you have like for, we've all seen the modern <laughs> ditch lights where you have one on one off. That's phase A, phase B. So if you're doing a firebox flicker, you can get two that are out of phase with each other. So you get a really nice random effect on it. Then you have what's called crossing logic, which happens when the whistle is blown or the horn is blown. That's not something we would use in this era. And then you have LED compensation to add. And then that just changes the lighting effect. Um, if you want to see it, I'll show you kind of an effect here because I can always go back and change this. So. I got to let this current keeper charge for a second. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the headlight to a standard Mars light. And so what this a Mars light is, it's more of a modern appliance on, on, you know, 50s, 60s era. But the idea is that it's a light bulb that has a casting behind it that rotates in a figure eight pattern. And it's that flash from the reflector that draws our eyes as a motorist to the giant train that's about to run us over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's why these became, you know, more used during the diesel era was because the diesels were a little quieter. People in general were becoming more mobile and there were more incidents at crossings. And so that's where all these warning devices came into play. So hopefully this will be sufficient enough, but I'm going to bring this over here and you'll see the headlight pattern is kind of a Mars light. So you can see it, but it doesn't have a really bright flash. Right. Okay. So now, the, all I did there was just enable the, just enable the Mars light. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that headlight and I'm going to do the same lighting effect, but now I'm going to add LED compensation. And so now, now when I bring it over to the camera, you can see how much more animated that light is. Yep. Yeah. And so that's what LED compensation does. It just changes the signal through the wire so that your LED appears more animated. That's and remarkable. because they have different illuminating properties than in, in a uh, traditional incandescent light bulb. Whoops. That's cool. I just knocked my stack off. Oops. There we go. So, but that's all that does is that just changes the way the signal is sent through the rails or through the wires, I mean. I love it. I love it. Good. Anybody else? Yeah, I do. John? Um, I, uh, I find setting up a sound decoder to be kind of daunting. Okay. It's been it, not, not because it's hard to do. Uh, I use Decoder Pro mm -hmm. and I have a, a Sprog 3 and a piece of flex track on the workbench. So I sit there mm -hmm. and do it. 
Um, last time I did one, it was uh, was in economy. Is that how you pronounce them? Economy. Yes. Yeah, it was oh, one economy of was right. Very happy with it. Um, but listening to what you have to say about the tsunami too, I think what I would find daunting about it is okay. You have, you have how many whistles? How many bells? Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of. There's a lot to choose from there. What what I would find helpful mm -hmm. is if, say, for your locomotive that you're showing us, your Bachman 440, mm -hmm. if it were possible to get a cheat sheet with the values on there that you've set for that, for the sound effects mm -hmm. in particular and the lighting effects. Now, a locomotive that I might do, uh, or the next one I have in mind, isn't isn't going to be a Bachman locomotive but it's going to be a 440 ho of mm -hmm. the period so settings that you have for motor control probably wouldn't be appropriate but sound and lighting effects would be and mm -hmm. if i knew what you had set those two i would have a starting point okay so a um, to get that uh, I can put something together for you guys. I can send it to Tom and he can send it out to the group. Um, or you can just shoot me a direct email, georgeb at soundtracks.com. And, uh, and then I'll put that together for you. But one thing I didn't really talk much about is, yeah, you talked about 90 whistles, 54 bell recordings, um, 10 exhaust chuffs, 10 air compressors and so forth. And I can see where you're coming from with it being daunting. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I didn't really mention much about the whistles is uh, the whistles in the steam era were not very standardized like we have our diesels today. Um, there were specific railroads that have a uh, air horn of choice. And then nowadays, even with some of the modern GVOs and, and the SD70 ACEs have an air horn that's assigned to that model of locomotive. Um, and so you can usually hear the air horn and determine which one. Well, the reason I point that out is because the steam era wasn't very standardized. And there were a lot of times uh, engineers had their own whistle. And so the first thing they would do is climb up onto their train, whatever locomotive they were assigned to, take the whistle off and put their whistle on. So town folk could tell old Bob was running his train today because they hear his whistle on the train. Um, and what that does is it gives you guys a little bit of flexibility to decide what you like. Um, this particular decoder here, I will be 100% uh, honest with you and say this is the early version of the Tsunami 2 that only has 63 whistles. And <laughs> the reason that, well, the I reason feel that off. <laughs> well, the reason this bums me out a little bit is one of my favorite whistles is now on the 90 whistle version. So this is going to get upgraded at some point. Right. Um, but it's but there's I think there's five or six different single chime whistles that are on there. And they were all recorded under steam so that that way you get that nice saturated steam sound effect. But the thing is, is like, you know, we don't have a whole lot of those type of records that we, you know, we're not recording everything like that. So where, you know, this locomotive here had, would have a single chime, nobody would say anything if you said, well, no, it has a three chime. And they'd say, oh, okay, <laughs> because who's going to, who's going to challenge? I have a friend of mine, he's a big steam fanatic and he, that's all he runs. Um, he will not have a diesel on his layout and he changes the whistle every single time. Um, every single operating session, he changes to a different whistle. And you know, that, that's, that's the great flexibility. But um, you know, when it comes to some of the sound effects, you know, like I said, the bell and, and the exhaust chuff and things like that, there's not really a standard to say, all locomotives of this nature use this one. All locomotives of this nature use this. Um, because the steam chuff, there's actually several factors. Uh, one of them is the cylinder size. One of them is the, the exhaust stack and how it's, uh, um, how it's designed and so forth. And then, of course, the operating pressure changes also. Because these small locomotives were probably running somewhere around 150 to 125 PSI. Whereas nowadays, you've got some of these big locomotives running at 300 PSI. Right. So it, it really changes a lot, but it gives you that flexibility to just kind of go through and listen and decide what you like or what you think that locomotive is. Because, right. you know, we get a lot of questions where customers will watch a, uh, like, a, say, for example, a Pentrex video. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, how come I can get my New York Central whatever to sound like this? It's like, well, look closely at that video. 
reason is is because all of those sounds are dubbed in because they're professional uh they're professional productions and so watching silent videos don't sell as much and they're not as exciting so what happens is is that they do a lot of production and you'll see that they'll just find something close and so you can't really use a lot of those as a guide um luckily for this era we have like uh some locomotives out there like the york the leviathan um you know and the two that are out of golden or uh, uh promontory point that we can at least have a feel of what they would sound like um and i i believe one of those chups is from one of those locomotives but i don't remember which one it is off the top of my head right um, i'd be lying if i told you 100 percent for sure um i know one of the three lights is the uh as the c18 that runs um in town uh, or I say in town, they, they keep it up at Silverton, but it's the 318 C, uh, C18, 315 C18 class locomotive. But anyway, the point is, is that there, there's so many different factors in there that you can kind of go in and play with it and, and just kind of like it. But yes, if you would like, I will send you a profile of all these sound selections, <laughs> everything I picked, just send me an email, georgeb at soundtracks.com. Let me know what it is. Um, I have no idea what the settings are, so I have to go back and read them. So it may take me a few days to get back to you, but I will send that list over well, to you if you want. Well, I if think you, if you put it, to, if you if you send it to Tom, he can post it on the site. Would you be willing yeah. to do that? Yeah, I can Would do that. Tom, Tom, is that okay with you? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So okay. something for you, John. I I know what you were saying because you know what. On one level, getting the, the tsunami too was exciting because of all the options. Uh, I use NCE system, and when I discovered that it was okay to program on the main, you can change the sounds pretty quick, run it, hear it, and then you can move into the next one. So once you get into a rhythm of the programming, it's actually pretty cool because you get to put different sounds in different locomotives, whatever that's worth. Right. Well, I, I, have N, I have NCE as well. Um, Although I'm more used to doing it with the um, Picoder Pro and the Sprague, um, but this would this would be a starting point, right? This would be a file, if you will, that is appropriate for the kind of locomotive that I would be working with. I get it. Yeah, yep. it'd be it'd be a starting point, and depending mm -hmm. on how finicky I was it might be this the ending point but it right. might <laughs> right I get it thank you hey, mate can I ask another question of George sure fire away George um is it very difficult to uh put one of your I've got a couple of the, your tsunamis um is it difficult to change out the Bachman the ones that are already DCC with no oh, it's easy because okay. they're already DCC. So basically, if we supplied the decoder, the terminals are lab you're usually labeled as far as what their purpose are. So it's literally a matter of taking your LR, I think it's LR or LH and RLRH, whatever it is, that's your left rail and right rail and connecting okay. it to the red and black wire. Okay. And then your uh, M plus and minus would be the motor leads, of course. Um, the only thing is, is you will need to add a resistor for your LED lights. Right. Okay. okay. It's just that I've, I've, I've run Tom's locomotives and I got the Bachmann's because it's, I wanted to get started and kind of play with DCC, mm -hmm. but I've been envious of Tom's locomotives and the sounds he gets. So. <laughs> Thanks to George. Okay. Yeah. It definitely does. Like, like you said, it, it definitely becomes addicting because, you know, usually when people get one uh, steam locomotive or one sound system going, it turns out that's what they run. That's the one they run all the time. They find that the silent ones just don't have the same uh, experience anymore. So that's what really makes it um, much more fun to run. And, and now with all the features that we built into it, it really does feel like you're more like you're running the locomotive rather than playing with a train on a tabletop. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, amen. Yeah, I, I, I thought that uh, when Tom was going that way, I thought, oh, I'll just run regular DC and now I'm an addict. What can I say? <laughs> yes. Those the, kind uh, of addicts are okay. Right, right. <laughs> the American Civil War Railroad Historical Society and addicts at large. 
Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So I really thank you guys for hanging in this long because we're, we're over time. Thanks so much to uh, Charlie for that presentation and the research and the beautiful modeling. George, for your time and sharing us, uh, sharing with us your knowledge and promoting and even inspiring us to uh, explore some more options with the sound. Uh, so with that, great time, guys. Thank you so much. I love seeing you. You take care. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we do, uh, I think, is it, let's see, is it John you're on next time with decals? I, I believe so. I'll have to check. Yeah. And so. then Don and I are going to do a presentation also in, around interpreting the colors. So from all these black and white photos, how can you determine what's yellow and what's green and what have you? So uh, I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. Well, Tom, send me that link. I actually wouldn't mind chiming in on that one and listening in, if you don't mind. I'd love. Yeah, you will. You will always be included. Don't ever worry okay. about that. Yep, for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Thank well, you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So long, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.